we're going to derive Newton's law of universal gravitation, which says that any two objects in the universe pull on each other with the force of gravity. But first, imagine you're walking down the road. A car is zooming by and your friend is concerned for your safety. Here it is from above. The road looks like that, there comes the car, and you're moving this way. How does your friend turn you away from the road? Well, if she tries to push you this way, you'll just speed up. If she tries to push you this way, you'll just slow down. But if she pulls you this way, you'll turn. In order for something to turn, requires that there be a force directed perpendicular to the velocity. This arrow and that arrow are at 90 degrees. Here's another example of something that's turning, a planet. Imagine the planet's just hurling off in this direction. It's moving really fast and Newton's first law says it's not going to slow down or speed up and it's not going to turn unless there's an unbalanced force pulling it. So if the force pulls it perpendicularly, it'll turn. What do planets turn around? They turn around a sun or a star. Now this planet has some radius for its orbit. We call that the orbital radius. And the time it takes to make one revolution to go around once, that's called the orbital period, capital T. If you take this planet, and let's say it's the Earth, if you take the orbital period squared and you divide by the radius cubed, then for the Earth you have 365.2 days divided by 150 million kilometers roughly, and you make that cubed, you get 0 0.040. Now let's take a different planet like Venus. It has a different radius, a different orbital radius, and a different orbital period to go around once. But if you take t squared over r cubed, here are the values for Venus, and what do you get? 0 0.040. In fact, it doesn't matter what planet you choose. It could be as far out or as close as you like. No matter what planet you choose, the orbital period squared divided by the orbital radius cubed always equals the same constant value. This is known as Kepler's third law, and we'll refer to it as such later in the video. That was pretty puzzling to scientists back in the 1600s. And after all, they didn't even know what was pulling on planets to make them turn until Newton came along. Imagine you take an apple and you let it fall. Why does it go down? Because gravity pulls it down. Newton said that the total force on an object is equal to its mass times its acceleration. In this case, the total force is just the gravity force. Nothing else pulls. The object's mass we'll call little m, and its acceleration, hmm. We've learned that no matter what you drop near the surface of the Earth, if it's an apple, or a banana, or a watermelon, the acceleration is always 9.81 meters per second squared, and we call that value little g. Little g is a constant. It doesn't change for different objects. But even though this is a constant, the gravity force is not the same for different objects. A watermelon is heavier and has a bigger gravity force than an apple. That gravity force depends only upon the mass of the object because little g is fixed and it's the same for all objects. So what we do is we write a proportionality like this which takes away anything that's constant and it shows only the things that can change to impact the value of fg. This is a really important proportionality. It says that the gravity force pulling on an object is proportional to the object's mass. The gravity force here pulling on the apple is proportional to the apple's mass. And if this were a watermelon, the gravity force pulling on the watermelon would be proportional to the watermelon's mass. We're going to use this later. So we're going to put a blue box around it. And remember, the blue box means we've seen that before. Now, when you drop the apple, what are you standing on? The Earth. If you drop the apple from here, it's pulled this way. If you drop, drop the apple from here, it's pulled that way. So what's actually pulling on the apple? And we don't want to say gravity. We want to be more specific. What's pulling on the apple? It's the Earth itself that pulls the apple. 
And we can see that because of where the apple is getting pulled. It must be the earth pulling. Let's write that down. The apple is pulled by the earth. Newton's third law says if you have two objects, A and B, and if A is pulled by B with the force F, then B is pulled by A with the force F. In this case, what are objects A and B? Apple and Earth. If the apple is pulled by the Earth with a force, Fg, then the Earth is pulled by the apple with a force, Fg. You just switch the order of the two. Wait a second. The Earth is being pulled? That's what this says. And in fact, not only does the apple pull on the Earth, but the person pulls on the Earth too. How do we know? Because the Earth pulls on the person. Now we said earlier that the gravity force pulling on an object is proportional to the object's mass. So the gravity force pulling on the apple is proportional to the apple's mass. And the gravity force pulling on the Earth must be proportional to the Earth's mass. And we'll call the Earth's mass big M. That's pretty weird. Because look at this. The two gravity forces are the same according to Newton's third law. That means the gravity force on the apple is proportional to the apple's mass, and that same force is proportional to the Earth's mass. The gravity force pulling on the person is proportional to her mass, and her gravity force is proportional to the Earth's mass. We're almost ready to put this all together. Imagine you're sitting under an apple tree, and the apple at the very top is about to come loose. If it does, it'll be pulled down by gravity. And then you look over and you see another apple tree twice as high. There's an apple at the top, and you think to yourself, hmm, if that apple comes loose, it'll be pulled down by gravity too. And then you look, and the next thing you see is the moon, with its mass little m. And you think to yourself, if gravity can reach all the way up, to the highest apple tree, maybe gravity can reach all the way up to the moon and pull on the moon too. That's really important because remember what the moon is doing? It's turning. Something has to be pulling the moon toward the middle of its path. Newton said maybe the thing pulling on the moon is the gravity force. Another way to express this is like an equation. Here's the equation for Newton's brilliant idea. It says the gravity force is what provides the net centripetal force pulling the moon toward the center of its circle. The net centripetal force on the right side, well, we know that formula. It's mass times speed squared over the radius. Now we can take speed and plug in distance over time. In one orbital period, when we go around once, how far do we travel? The circumference, 2 pi r. If we distribute the squared to everything in parentheses, the 2, the pi, the r, and the t, and then we simplify the r's, we get this. Now watch what happens when we multiply both sides by t squared over r. The t squareds cancel, the r's cancel, and we're left with just 4 pi squared m. And on the left side, look at what we have. It's almost Kepler's third law. You have t squared, you have a constant over here, but we're missing the r cubed. Right now we just have a single r. So when we plug in for gravity, we're going to have to put 1 over r squared because you need an r squared to combine with this r to make Kepler's third law. Now what about the numerator? We know it's in the denominator. Well, if the numerator is a 4, then the 4s will cancel. If the numerator is a 3, we can just move it to the right side with the other constants. No matter what the numerator is, the point is it has to be some constant, which combines on the right with these constants. The important fact is that the force of gravity has to be some constant divided by r squared. Why? Because that r squared combines with this r to make Kepler's third law. And so Newton said, that force of gravity is proportional to the inverse of r squared. When we take these three things together, we can put them into one single proportionality. 
the force of gravity on an object like an apple is proportional to the apple's mass times the Earth's mass divided by the distance between them squared. But Newton looked at this equation and said, you know what, this isn't just true for apples. It's true for watermelons and uh, for you know, bananas and anything else on the Earth. But it's not even true just at the Earth. It's true for objects that orbit the Sun, like Mercury and Venus and Earth. All those planets are moving in orbit, and so they must feel gravity forces too. And by the end of that thought, Newton said, maybe this equation is true for any two masses that are separated by some distance r. For any two masses in the universe, each one feels an attractive gravity force, which is proportional as given by this equation. This is a pretty wild and bold statement. Right now, as you watch this video, your nose is being pulled by the monitor. Why? Because both objects, your nose and the monitor, have mass, and gravity acts between mass. Right now, the wall that you're in the room that you're standing in, the wall is pulling on your left hand. How do we know? Because both objects have mass, and gravity acts between mass. This formula, Newton said, applies to any two masses in the entire universe. And this is Newton's law of universal gravitation. We've seen that the way to derive it is by deriving each constituent proportionality. So we've come up with this proportionality statement, and we know that when there's a proportion, there is a proportionality constant. So in math class, you might use the letter K, and when you introduce the constant of proportionality, it changes this proportionality symbol to an equal sign. But instead of the letter K, we're gonna use the letter G. So here we go, my proportionality statement, I'm going to make it an equal sign now, and my proportionality constant will call G, and if I solve this equation for G, I get this, and we know that the force of gravity is calculated with your mass times G, or 9.8. So I'm gonna replace force of gravity with mg. The little m's cancel, and I'm left with this. I'm gonna plug in 9.8 for G, the radius of the Earth is 6,378 kilometers, or 10 to the third meters. That gets squared. And the mass of the Earth is 5.972 times 10 to the 24th kilograms. And when you calculate this number, you get 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11th. And looking at the units here, and looking at the units here, uh, for G, we're going to use the unit newtons per kilogram instead of meters per second squared. They are equivalent. Meters in measured, radius is measured in meters, of course, and mass is measured in kilograms. So this comes out to be newton meters squared per kilogram squared. So here's our value of G, which is called the universal gravitational constant. So 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11th newton meters squared per kilogram squared. So here is Newton's universal law of gravitation. I've plugged in the value for G to illustrate a point here. Any two objects with mass attract each other. Let's just say, uh, and if they're very close, here R is in the denominator, the closer they are, the bigger FG is going to be. So let's, to make things simple here, let's just say the two masses are one meter apart. So R squared is just one. So I'm gonna cover that up because it's just one. And now you can see, because the gravitational constant is so small, right? 10 to the minus 11th, that means the M's have to be huge in order for the force of attraction between them to be appreciable. Even if these were a thousand kilograms each, a thousand times a thousand is 10 to the sixth. And when you multiply 10 to the sixth times 10 to the minus 11th, you still have 10 to the minus five Newtons. So that's why we say gravity is a very weak force. It takes huge amounts of mass to make this a noticeable force. So that force between you and the person next to you or the pencil you're holding in your hand and its attraction to your head, all those forces are so tiny 
that you don't notice them. And let's go ahead and plug in the value for the mass of the Earth and the radius of the Earth. And what you see is when you do this calculation, look what you get, 9.8. So this is saying the force of gravity is m times 9.8 mg. And there we go. Our equation for weight W equals mg is really just a simplification of Newton's law of universal gravitation. Although Newton's law of gravitation applies strictly to particles, we can also apply it to real objects as long as the sizes of the objects are small relative to the distance between them. The moon and earth are far enough apart so that to a good approximation, we can treat them both as particles. But what about an apple and earth? From the point of view of the apple, the broad and level earth stretching out to the horizon beneath the apple certainly does not look like a particle. Newton solved the apple earth problem by proving an important theorem called the shell theorem. The shell theorem states a uniform spherical shell of matter attracts a particle that is outside the shell as if all the shell's mass were concentrated at its center. Earth can be thought of as a nest of such shells, one within another, and each shell attracting a particle outside Earth's surface as if the mass of that shell were at the center of the shell. Thus, from the apple's point of view, Earth does behave like a particle, one that is located at the center of the Earth and has a mass equal to that of Earth. So that when we are standing on the surface of the Earth, we are attracted to the Earth as if we are a distance of the radius of the Earth away from its center.